I'm going to start. Um, welcome to the 23rd in our Middle Eastern Islamic History series. Um, this series goes all the way back to July of 2021, and we've had an episode every week covering uh, from what does Islam stand for um, to uh, the development of the Rashidun Caliphate, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Turkic, uh, the Turkic groups like the Seljuks, um, and we got up to the point of Selim the Grim and the Safavid Empire uh, when we're going to do a retrospective and just cover the Armenians uh, from the ancient period through to the medieval period where we had ended with Selim the Grim and uh, the Safavids. Hopefully, um, uh, hopefully the uh, people will be able to see the past presentations and compare them. Hopefully we'll be able to get to uh, all the medieval stuff that we want to do today. Um, unfortunately, uh, if uh, the scope covers up until the year 1650 or so, so most of the modern Armenian history, um, in particular the genocides and the modern Republic of Armenia, the nagorno karabakh conflict, those will not be covered today. But trust me, we have more than enough history uh, to get us through two amazing hours. So um, the rules for those of you who are less familiar with what I do. So the first one is that this is not an academic presentation. I'm not accredited in history, language, philosophy, theology, um, Armenian studies, anything similar to that. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade, and this is just something that I have a passion about, um, Middle Eastern history and, and, and that world. And I'm going to give this from a secular sort of overbroad uh, perspective meaning that uh, I'm not going, I'm going to try as best as I can to uh, look at the history just as history um, without coming to it from a pro-Armenian bias or an anti-Armenian bias, just this is the history of the Armenian people. But of course we need to be respectful. This is obviously an important uh, and delicate matter. So um, Will Wheaton's rule certainly applies. Um, and that said, this is not me shouting at a computer, or it shouldn't be. Um, I would love questions, comments, clarifications. So if you put something in the chat, if you raise your hand, I'm more than happy uh, to answer the question. And you should do it while I'm giving the presentation. You shouldn't wait till the end of the presentation. If there's something that I'm going to cover in the future, I'll just tell you and, uh, and, and that'll be fine. Um, I love questions and comments. Um, and that's part of how I designed this class. I designed it as a 101 and a 201, which means that if you don't know anything, I'll try and catch you up. And if you know something already, I hope that I'll be able to add another layer, something that you didn't know, something more esoteric. And this class will have a two hour hard stop, which means that whatever we don't get to in two hours from now, that's it. We're not gonna do any further slides. I'll still answer questions. Um, uh, I'll still answer questions. I'll still uh, talk about some of the issues, but I won't go to any new slides. You won't miss any new material. Um, you know that uh, that we have sort of an agreement that after two hours, we're done, and that's cool. Um, yeah, uh, and of course, the final rule, thank you, Valerie, is that this is recorded just like all the other entries into the Middle Eastern uh, History Group series, and you're free to watch it at your own disposition. It's being um, live streamed on YouTube as well. So if you want that portability, you can uh, you can switch there. And uh, without further ado, everybody who's been here before, this is their favorite part, the quiz, to see what you remembered from being here last time. So uh, the first question, which of the following characterizes Urartu Bianili? Choose all that apply. And uh, feel free to raise your hand or to put your answer in the chat. Um, this is a choose all that apply, so there should be multiple answers that are correct. All right, D is definitely one of the ones that's correct. Yeah, everybody can guess. 
and if, and if you're new, you can guess too. Like, um, F F is absolutely correct as well. B and D are correct. Uh, the only one we're missing is E, right? B, D, E, and F are all correct answers, right? It was a confederation in the Armenian highlands uh, composed of many different ethnicities. The dominant ethnicity was Ahurian people for the majority of the period, but the Armenians were definitely part of that society. And there are documents from uh, the period that refer to Urar Zubianili as Armenia. Um, so there's definitely a presence of Armenians, if not the dominant uh, group. Um, it was rich in mineral wealth and exported uh, copper, silver, gold, iron, and many other uh, minerals. Um, they had their own vineyards and their own unique wines, which they still have to this day. And um, they were famous for the breeding of horses. Um, they also built large defensible fortresses at the edges of their territory. One of those uh, edges was Erebuni, uh, the modern city of Yerevan, which is the capital of post-Soviet Armenia. And that's the term that I'm going to use for the modern Republic of Armenia. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, they had their own unique pantheon. So uh, question number two, which of the following describes what happened to Armenia in the 300s BCE? Um, I have one guess, which is B. Um, B is the wrong century, so that's not correct. Um, yes, uh, answer C is correct. Nice going, Beverly. So yes, it started as an immediate uh, Achaemenid satrapy that rebelled for a few years, right? We were talking about the great satraps revolt in 360 BCE, and then they gained independence in the wake of the Diodachi Wars, which occurred after Alexander conquered the Persian Empire in the 330s BCE. So by 321 BCE, King Orontes II declared the independent Armenian uh, kingdom. That was, um, yeah, that was uh, one of the first Armenian states. Um, the answer D is a little bit further in history, um, and so is answer A. Okay, question number three. Which of the following best describes King Tiridates III? Is it A, he was originally a believer in Armenian Zoroastrianism and discriminated against Christians, but eventually converted to Christianity and discriminated against others? Is it B, he was, a de he was deeply opposed to Roman Emperor Diocletian and allied with the Sassanians to repel him from Armenian territory? C, he was a relatively weak ruler, allowing the Armenian state to collapse and leading to the institution of the Marsban? Or D, he was a powerful conqueror, extending the Armenian control all the way to the Mediterranean Sea? And Catherine answered A, so did Winifer. Uh, we're getting a lot of A here, that is exactly correct. Um, he was originally a polytheist who converted to Christianity and deeply discriminatory of whatever religion he was not at the time. Okay, question number four. Which three of the following statements about the Mars Panet are true? The Mars Bon, uh, Yes, it is true that Armenia was the first nation to declare itself a Christian nation, yeah. So A, the Marsban maintained its own personal military and the Sassanids never provided any additional soldiers or forces to protect the Marsban. B, the Marsban was a political office appointed by the Sasanians. C, the Nakharars or Armenian nobles were responsible for the overthrow of the Arsacid kings and the creation of the Marspanate. D, Shah Yazdegerd II was incredibly supportive of Armenian Christianity, as evidenced by his strong approval for the Council of Seleucia Ctesiphon. E, the Nakharars, or Armenian nobles, were incredibly supportive of the Mars Panet. Or F, during the time of the Mars Panet, Armenians led by Ma the Mamikonians uh, fought for the right to believe in Christianity and finally gained it in the Treaty of Varsak. If you guess, you have a 50-50 shot of being right. <laughs> F 
F is definitely correct. Nice job, Beverly. What are, uh, let's see if we can get the other two answers. Um, D was a trick answer of mine. Um, Shall I ask to go to the second approved of the Church of the East, the Nestorian Church, and that's how, what he did in the Council of Seleucia Ctesiphon. But since um, the Armenian Apostolic Church was a different church from uh, that church, it was not uh, well respected. And Yazdegerd II performed many massacres against the Armenians. Um, a is also not correct. That was a tricky one that I put there. Um, the Marsban always required soldiers from the Sassanids in order to rule effectively. So um, the answers are B, the Marsban was a political office appointed by the Sassanids. Um, and C, the Nahurars or Armenian nobles were responsible for the overthrow of the kings and the creation of the Marspanid. Um, they they asked the Sassanids to overthrow their king, the last Arsacid king. Um, they believed that he was making uh, rules that opposed their will and desires as individual nobles. But it turned out that the solution was worse than the problem which it it's in, intended to solve. And as soon as the Marspanid was created, they realized just how wrong they had been to invite the Sassanids to take power. And then, of course, F, as we pointed out, was the response was that the Nakharars, led by Mamikonyan, uh, fought against uh, the Sassanids for the right to believe their own faith. And yes, um, the uh, on, on the question that's going on in the chat, yes, the Armenians declared Christianity as the official state religion in the year 301. The Romans wouldn't declare Christianity as the state religion for another decade or so. Um, so now within the Roman Empire, it's estimated that at this time, maybe eight to 10% of Roman citizens were Christian and that's all across the empire. But, um, but uh, it was not the case that, um, it was not the case that in the empire, uh, sorry, in, that in the Roman Empire, when Tiridates made uh, Christianity the official religion of Armenia, that Roman was Christian. And also, as we pointed out, the church in the Roman Empire was the unified church, the one that would eventually become the split between um, Orthodox and Catholics and Protestants, all that's part of the unified church. The Armenians were part of Oriental Orthodoxy, uh, which, reject, which rejected the fourth council, which I guess I'm giving away the answer to the next question. Um, but the re uh, I have a question here. Why did the Armenians accept Christianity before everyone else? Um, I, uh, Tiridates III uh, accepted Christianity. Um, I, the apocryphal story from the Armenian church is that um, Gregory the Illuminator uh, was a Christian, um, and we talked about this in the first session, um, who was brought before Tiridates III and cured him of an ailment. And so Tiridates III was convinced that Christianity was the one true religion and converted and converted his entire country. Um, there is likely uh, a degree to which Tiridates also saw a political advantage by being Christian against the Sasanians who were Zoroastrian um, and allowed them to make a clear break with the, uh, with the Sasanians in terms of political power. So there's probably a mix of both reasons. Within Rome, the conversion to Christianity is much less clear. Um, there, there are different reasons. It's spread among the soldiers. It's spread among some of the poor populations. Um, King Constantine was also on his deathbed when he converted. It's, uh, Emperor Constantine, sorry, was on his deathbed when he converted. There's a lot of different things going on. So anyway, the Armenian Apostolic Church broke with the Catholic Church or the Unified Church under which of the following circumstances? The Armenians do not agree with the claim of hypostatic union, that Jesus was divine in the womb, proposed by the Council of Ephesus in 431. Armenians do not agree with the claim of diophysitism, that Jesus, that Jesus had two natures that were differentiable but unified, uh, proposed in the Council of Chalcedon in 451. The Armenians did not agree with the Catholic claim that Rome was the primary see and the other cities of the Pentarchy were subordinates in 1054. The Armenians refused to add the filioque language appended by the Roman Catholic Church to the Nicene Creed. And since I basically gave the answer about a second ago, um, the answer is B. That's right. Um, the answer is B. They did not agree with diophysitism. Uh, I made the joke last time that it's the saltwater Jesus versus the oil slick Jesus, um, right? In uh, unified church thought, Jesus has two distinct natures, his divine nature and his human nature, and they are combined in some way to create Jesus's complete nature. 
because but but at a fundamental level these are differentiable entities um the armenians disagreed and said that um jesus's human nature and jesus divine nature although they were separate entities could not be differentiated and were just so mixed that it would be impossible to tear it apart yes and patrick you're correct um the philosophy in opposition to dia uh, uh, uh sorry Antiophysitism is miaphysitism, um, 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 although the detractors of miaphysitism called it monophysitism. Anyway, not very important. Um, it's just important to know that they separated. So last time we talked about Armenia as a historic region. And so when I say Armenia, I'm not referring to the current Republic of Armenia. That's a very small part of the historic land that used to be Armenia. And it was this land in the highlands. You can see on the map on the lower left-hand side that Armenia is actually a very small piece of the modern, uh, of that area that was part of that Armenian highlands, that raised area um, where Armenian confederations um, were. Um, I have a question. Um, all the Eastern churches rejected the Filioque, but the Oriental Orthodox churches, like the Armenian church, like the Assyrian church of the East, like the Ethiopian church, didn't even address the Filioque controversy because they had already broken from the unified church before this was a controversy. So while Eastern Orthodoxy rejected it in name, Oriental Orthodoxy didn't have to because they weren't part of the unified church. But if we look, yeah, so if we continue on the map, right, that's, that's one of the things that we sort of addressed is that Armenia is this unified area that's now divided between Turkey, uh, the country of Iran today, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. All these three countries have parts of historic Armenia. And we also mentioned that the Armenians um, had four different large kingdoms. Um, these four different large kingdoms, uh, we addressed two of them last time, right? We talked about Artaxiad Armenia and Arsacid Armenia. Um, but today we're going to hopefully talk about uh, uh, Bagratid Armenia and Rubinid Armenia, um, which are the next two major Armenian countries. I have a question as to whether the Armenian Apostolic Church is close to Nestorianism. And I would say that it's close in the sense that the two of these churches um, were separate from the unified church, but the Nestorian church broke away on, in the third ecumenical council, the council of Ephesus of 431, and uh, the Ap Armenian apostolic church broke away in the uh, council of Chalcedon in 451. So the Armenians still considered the Nestorian church to be a heresy. Um, they just, because uh, their break was later. Um, and the two churches have not been united uh, in any synod. Yes, exactly. I have a comment. The Nestorians believe that Mary bore the human Christ, meaning that when uh, Christ was in the womb, there was no hypostatic union, right? Christ was not himself God until the birth moment. Okay. So we, uh, I'm, I'm unclear. Oh, yes. So uh, these four countries were at different points in time. These were countries that were ruled by Armenians. And uh, with the exception of Artaxid Armenia at this largest extent, the majority of their population were Armenians. Um, so these, uh, so if you look at the time frame, these are in succession, um, different kingdoms uh, run and majoritarily uh, personified by Armenians. Um, so that's why there's four Armenias. And if you look in the center, you have the modern Armenian coat of arms, which recognizes uh, these four historic Armenian countries as being part of the history of Armenia. Uh, does that sort of answer the question, Leslie? Well, we're gonna talk about the great house of Cilicia. So um, stay tuned. Um, so last time we addressed uh, Urartu Bianili, right? We talked about this sort of kingdom. You can see it's right in the heartland of Armenia. Um, uh, and when, again, when I say Armenia, I'm referring to this large area. I'm not referring to post-Soviet Armenia. Um, so in, in today's borders, this composes parts of Turkey, parts of Iran, parts of Armenia, parts of Azerbaijan. Um, so You've got this country, um, and as we pointed out, they're renowned for their horses, uh, for their iron, um, and uh, they eventually become a satrap within the Persian Empire. Um, that satrap 
uh, eventually achieves independence and achieves its greatest military success um, under their king uh, Tigranes II the Great, uh, who conquers all the way to Judea um, and makes a number of different countries either vassals or direct annexed territories. Uh, he would lose this territory very quickly uh, to the Romans through the Mithridatic Wars. We then saw Armenia sitting, um, the Osassid Kingdom of Armenia, sitting as sort of uh, an intermediate state between the Romans in the West and the Parthians in the East. Um, they were generally in the Roman sphere, um, but uh, they still maintained a certain level of relations with the, Armen uh, with the uh, Parthians. We then talked about King Tiridates and his conversion to Christianity and how this resulted in a new change for Armenian policy. We then talked about uh, about 100 years, 150 years later, um, Tiridates' uh, kingdom, the Arsacid kingdom of Armenia was overthrown when the Nakharar or Armenian, uh, Armenian nobles partition, uh, petitioned the Sasanians to overthrow the kingdom and institute the Marsban, which was this governor who would sit uh, in the city of Dvin. And this governor would be responsible for uh, Armenia. Now, one of the things to notice on this map, right, is that we have something labeled as Persian Armenia. And that's because the Armenian territories have now been split between the Byzantine Empire in the West and those that are under Persian suzerainty in the East. And something that we should always bear in mind is that there's a very uh, fluid definition of independence that we're going to be using uh, throughout this period. Um, there are all kinds of things on the way from being a province of a larger empire to being a completely independent entity. So sometimes you have a province, sometimes you have an autonomous province, sometimes you have a vassal state, sometimes you have uh, a tributary state, sometimes you have a completely independent state. And Armenia um, and a lot of the smaller countries in this region, like Albania, like Shirvan, like Iberia, like Colchis, like Imereti, all of these Caucasian states, um, will be moving in and out of these states of quasi-independence um, throughout the following period that we're going to get into. And still to this day, um, I mean, today, no, nobody would say that they're a vassal, but there are definitely claims by post-Soviet Armenians that they've become a vassal of Russia. So there, so there is a certain degree to which this even still continues. We then talked about... Um, the Armenian sort of fight for independence and self-identity from the Marspanate, right? The Marsban was ruling in Dvin, um, and the Nakharars, these Armenian nobles, wanted to assert uh, power against them. One of the clearest ways to do this was through religious war, right? So you have the situations uh, where, Mer for example, Merzohan Arzruni, uh, he was executed uh, by Christian Nakharars for being an unapologetic Zoroastrian. Um, and being a supporter of the Persians. Then on the flip side, we have situations like King Arshak II, um, who was uh, an Armenian ruler um, before the creation of the Marsban, um, who had been taken by the Sassanids and put in the fortress of oblivion. Um, and King Arshak killed himself because he was unable to express his Christian faith um, and Drastamat, an Armenian who came to visit him, committed suicide upon seeing uh, his king do the same. Um, I have a question about how were citizens impacted by uh, the instability of the rulership. Um, you have to understand that these revolts, um, the, the, these revolts in a, if you're looking at it over the course of a century, they're happening very often. If you're looking at it as a day-to-day -day event, it's not that disruptive in this sense, right? Um, what ends up becoming much more disruptive is when you have large scale invasions. And we're going to see some of those um, today. Uh, but uh, the, the rebellions of the Nakharars against the Marspanate are individualistic um, crusades that are usually hundreds, if not thousands of people. Uh, we're not talking about great battles like the Battle of Avareyar, um, which is sort of a once in a while uh, kind of uh, kind of activity. And speak of the devil. So the Battle of Avarayar um, is in 451, right? We talked about this. And it 
pitted uh, Vardan Mamikonyan, who was one of these Nakharars, with a number of Armenians who wanted to freely practice Christianity against the Sasanians who were increasingly being repressive towards that. And the Battle of Avarear was a major defeat for the Armenians in the sense that tactically they were completely destroyed. Uh, in particular, the Sasanians had used war elephants um, and the Armenians did not know how to respond to this kind of attack. However, um, because uh, the Persians had problems on their eastern borders, on what's now Afghanistan, right? There, uh, in Afghanistan and in Turkmenistan, um, there were these Hephthalites who were a, a kind of Hunnic people. The Hephthalites had gone to war with the Persians and the Persians needed Armenian support in order to put down the Hephthalites. Um, and so they, they signed the uh, Treaty of Navarsak, which recognized Armenian Apostolic Church as an official recognized religion within uh, the Armenian, uh, within Persian Armenia. And this uh, forever granted, uh, as long as the Sasanians were in power, the Armenians the ability to build churches uh, and to worship um, the Christianity that they saw fit. And you can see in the, in the below, Vahan Mamikonyan from the same family, but not the same person, uh, signing uh, the Treaty of Navarsak uh, in the city of Devin, right? We remember the city of Devin is where the Marspanet is, uh, is headquartered. So this is exactly where the Persian emissaries would meet him. And then we talked about uh, the schisms in the church. We'll get into that a little bit more uh, later, but this is where we left off last week. So we have these wars uh, between the Sasanians and the Romans. Um, in particular, we have King Kavad I, um, king of kings of the Persian Empire, um, and he has just put down a major revolt in his country. He asks, asks for uh, financial assistance from the Byzantines, and the Byzantines refuse to provide it. So he uses this as a pretext to launch a war against the Byzantines in order to uh, take some of the lands that are on the border. And as you can see from the picture, um, the border region between the Sasanian Empire and the Roman Empire is Armenia. Um, so you've got Ar you have Persian Armenia on the eastern side, you have Roman Armenia or Byzantine Arme Armenia on the western side. And um, so Chief Minister Shukra of King Kavad I uh, launches a war. Um, he attacks the city of uh, Theodosiopoulos. He attacks the city of Edessa. Um, and, he and he raises siege to the city of Amida, um, all of these cities being cities with a large Armenian, if not majority Armenian population. Um, these wars end up being called the Anastasian Wars because it was Emperor Anastasius I of the Byzantine Empire who was in power uh, when this war began. And it was a very difficult war with large scale massacres by both Persians and Romans um, in this territory, trying to deplete the other of useful resources. Um, accordingly, many Armenian civilians died along with other local civilians. We then see uh, an increasing presence of Armenians in the Byzantine government, so, and in the Byzantine army. So we even have entire divisions of the Byzantine army made up of Armenians. And so they have distinctive dress and, uh, and uh, military gear. You can see there uh, with the rounded uh, with the rounded shield and the pole arm. We also see the introduction of Armenians into um, the actual leadership of the empire. The first um, half Armenian emperor was Emperor Heraclius, um, who ruled from 610 to 641. Um, Uh, what was the uh, what was the allure of what? Um, so we have uh, um, Armenians uh, who were involved uh, in the Roman Empire, like as I said, uh, Emperor Heraclius. We also had before him Emperor Maurice, uh, who had expanded the bureaucracy and included many Armenians uh, in government. Armenians were particularly seen as useful in terms of uh, record keeping, um, and they began to migrate further west from uh, what was originally the Armenian homeland to settle in, uh, in areas closer to Constantinople in order to be of use uh, to the Byzantine government. Um, I have a question about what was the benefit of them going uh, and supporting the Byzantines. Uh, the event is just simple. Um, the Byzantines had uh, the Byzantines as the runners of a multi-ethnic 
multinational empire were interested in incorporating the best and brightest talent um, in terms of their governmental administration. And the Armenians were relatively literate, relatively uh, well accomplished financially. Um, and so it made sense to incorporate them like it would any other minority. And the Armenians saw a strong affinity uh, to the Byzantine Empire as long as they had permission to practice their religion, which came and went depending on the emperor. Um, We also have Armenian participation in the Byzantine uh, Sasanian Wars. Um, in fact, uh, Vardan III Mamikonian, different from the Vardan Mamikonian in the Battle of Avarear, um, Vardan III was one of the key causes um, for the Byzantine Sasanian, the Second Byzantine Sasanian War. Um, he managed to antagonize the Sasanian government. Um, he was on in Persian Armenia. And he made an alliance with the Byzantines um, in order to protect him. Now, yeah, we talked about um, the third uh, Byzantine Sasanian War when we discussed in the second uh, in this series um, the foundations uh, that allowed Islam to prevail, but you can see. Uh, one of the things that we re didn't really talk about in that discussion was how Armenia really sits right at the border of the Byzantine and Sassanid empires. And one of the things to note, and you can see it sort of on this map, if you look very closely, almost all the areas of the Middle East were conquered by the Persians at some point during the third Byzantine uh, Sasanian War. Um, you can see Egypt is crosshatched, all the Levant region is crosshatched, uh, the eastern part of Anatolia is crosshatched, and including all of Armenia. So Armenia became the site of a lot of the conflict. And in particular, in the year 622, when her Emperor Heraclius of the Byzantine Empire is launching his counteroffensive against the Persians who had taken so much land in the early part of the war, that counteroffensive went right through the Armenian heartland. Um, he went through uh, north of Vaughan, then over the Aras River, and attacked. Um, Persian positions from the north as part of his counteroffensive against uh, the Sasanians. He burnt the city of Devin, right? We've been mentioning the city of Devin, this capital city of the Marspanate um, uh, and uh, one of the centers of uh, Armenian cultural life. Um, and he destroyed it on his way to defeating the Persians. At this same point, the Persians and the Byzantines had exhausted themselves completely on account of this war, um, which really gave the Islamic empire that was starting to form um, in, uh, yeah, in, in the Middle East, and that we discussed a little bit more in, this, in the third entry into this series, uh, to take advantage of this and to start, an ex start expanding north. Where it really matters for Armenia is that you begin this period uh, starting in 630, um, sorry, 632, where the Islamic Emirate that you can see here, this sort of green area, uh, this Islamic Emirate starts expanding outward. And in 634, they had already sent emissaries to Armenia and met with the Nakharars that were there. In fact, um, in 634, they had begun to speak with uh, Theodorus Rushtuni, um, and Theodorus Ustuni was one of these Nakharars, one of these Armenian nobles. And um, they convinced him to join up with them um, in terms of leaving the, uh, the Byzantine Empire, which, had, uh, which had now had dominion over the western part of Armenia, and to become a servant of the, uh, of the Muslim state. He would be guaranteed a certain amount of autonomy um, in the territory of Armenia. Um, if he would do this. Um, now, there were repeated times that the Byzantines would come in and reconquer, and Theodorus Rushtuni would declare allegiance to the Byzantines, and then the Arabs would come, and he would declare allegiance to the Arabs. But by 656, he had declared allegiance to each side too many times, uh, and the Arabs executed him and incorporated Armenia under a different set of Nakharars uh, based in also Dvin. Um, they decided to model the Persian system of creating uh, a governor 
who would sit in Devine, and we'll talk a little bit more about this system. Um, and that governor would uh, meet with the Nacharars, and the Nacharars would therefore continue to do local administration. From the, uh, from the Arab Muslim perspective, it was critical to control the Caucasus region um, and expand further north. So they had focused a lot more of their efforts in uh, the fortress of Derbent. You can see that up there, which they conquered in 651. They called it the Bab al Abweb, the door of doors, meaning that it was the entryway uh, to the Caucasus region. At that moment, the Caucasus region was controlled by the Khazars. And um, in many cases, Armenian help in repelling the Khazars was more important uh, to the Arabs than any kind of large scale subjugation. That said, you do have cases where, for example, King Adonase II of Iberia, Iberia being one of the Georgian kingdoms, King Adonase II um, rebelled uh, against Arab suzerainty, um, and uh, the Arabs were forced to fight wars uh, up in this Caucasus region. But generally speaking, they had a positive view uh, of their Armenian subjects. At the same time, we have other states in the Caucasus. Uh, one in particular is Caucasian Albania. And a Caucasian Albania, uh, you can see on the map on the right-hand side, uh, which is a little bit later in time, but, uh, but should sort of lay things out. Caucasian Albania is in the Western part of the modern country of Azerbaijan. And the Caucasian Albanians were like the, Arm uh, were like the Armenian church um, expelled uh, during the Council of Chalcedon. Um, for exactly the same reason. They didn't believe in the, uh, the Diophysitic uh, Christ. And from about 500 to about 700 uh, CE, they were an independent Eastern, uh, sorry, Oriental Orthodox Church. Around, but even at that point, there's a lot of consultation between the Caucasian Albanian Church and the Armenian Apostolic Church. By about the 700s, there weren't enough Christians um, in Caucasian Albania uh, to justify an independent church. And so the Caucasian Albanian church was folded into the Armenian Apostolic Church. Um, many of the kings of uh, Caucasian Albania uh, at this time were pious Christians. You can see King Javan Shir, um, who ruled roughly the same time as uh, Theodorus Ustuni, um, and, uh, and is the last king of Albania, the last independent king of Albania before Albania submitted uh, to Arab rule. And the dynasty would continue for another two centuries as uh, Arab suzerains. Now, this is where we start moving from history to um, current politics. And so I'm going to couch it in that. Um, the Azerbaijani government has made the claim that the Caucasian Albanian church has always been a unique and independent church and has supported the Udi minority, which is about a thousand people in the Republic of Azerbaijan. Um, as being a distinct uh, religious group under the Caucasian Albanian church. And you can see the Udis uh, have only a few churches left in Azerbaijan because of their small numbers. And this one in the center uh, is one of those Udi churches. And I chose that as a representation of the Caucasian Albanian church to the extent that it can be. Um, uh, the general view outside of Azerbaijan is that the Caucasian Albanian church is part of the Albanian, uh, sorry, the Armenian Apostolic Church and has no meaningful distinctions from the Armenian Apostolic Church um, in terms of its views or organization, since it is one of the sub, uh, subordinate parts of it. Um, so make of that what you will. Rich, I have a question. Sure. Hi. So the question is the following. Now, we know that, you know, um, there was a big um, confrontation between uh, Byzantine, uh, Byzantine and uh, uh, Arab states. Um, and the, between them was Hazars. Was there anything uh, like that to do with also Armenians to be? Yeah, uh, um, the, yeah, uh, yeah, I actually have a slide on that. So, um, all right. So we move into more centralized Arab rule under the Umayyads, right? The Rashidun Caliphate was the first Arab government and that government survived from about 632 until 
um, 661, when you had that Islamic civil war that, that, we, uh, that we talked about in, uh, in the fourth entry in this series. And during the Arab rule, Armenia was out of sight, out of mind for the majority of that period. Uh, the Umayyads um, were generally uh, ignorant of the region and disinterested in the region. However, there were Khazar raiders that came from the north of the Caucasus, and in addition to threatening Derbent, uh, they threatened a number of Armenian, uh, sorry, Arab holdings in the north of uh, the Middle East. So, uh, Caliph Abdul Malik ibn Marwan um, reached out to the Armenians and created a functional alliance with six of the major uh, Nakharar families. You can see them there, Mamikonian, the Bagratunis, the, the Gnunis, Rushtunis, Kam, uh, Kamsarakans, and Artsrunis. And by bringing these Nakharar families together, he was able to um, repel a number of threats like the Khazars um, that happened in 720, 730 under his successors. Um, but over the course of Arab rule, um, several of these families fell uh, in and out of favor um, with the uh, with the Arabs, the the Bagratunis and Artsunis really um, became seen as more loyal um, to the uh, to the Arabs than the other four families, and so the Arabs began to elevate them more and more uh, within the territory. Now, of course, uh, as the rules uh, governing the Islamic Empire became more solidified, Armenians had to play the jizya tax, which was a tax that all non-Muslims had to pay uh, for the right to practice uh, non-Islamic religion. But as long as they paid that tax, they were able to keep um, their, their holdings or their land. But there were occasions where the jizya tax was incredibly onerous. And we have documentation of Armenians petitioning uh, both uh, Damascus and Baghdad for a reprieve from these jizya taxes. And on account of this, we do have rebellions uh, from almost all of these uh, Nakharar families, but they never revolt as a unified force, and they never revolt in the name of Armenia. They only revolt to the extent that they are trying to limit their own either financial outlay or production outlay uh, to the Arab empires, be it the Umayyads or the Abbasid Caliphate. Now, when we talk about the structure of Arab rule in the region, the Arabs will introduce a wali or a governor, and this wali eventually becomes called the Ostikan or Ischan. Uh, both, both of these names are quite common. And this governor position survives more or less unchanged for the next 1,000 years, even though um, Armenia goes through a number of different uh, administrations uh, through those uh, from different empires. Uh, throughout those a thousand years, this rule, this uh, Ostikan or, or Ischan um, survives as a governor. Below the Ischan, uh, sorry, below the Ostikan is the Ischan, this prince. Um, and the prince is the one who has uh, direct uh, responsibility to the Ostikan, to the Wali. Um, and the prince will be an Armenian. The Wali Ostikan will be somebody appointed uh, by the occupying power. In this case, it's the Arabs. In later cases, it will be Persians or um, or Turks or whoever. And below the Ischan um, were the Nakharar, these Armenian noble families, right? So this was how power was distributed in Armenia, which was a lot less centralized and a lot less directly controlled than we've seen in other Abbasid and Umayyad provinces that were directly controlled by the Wali and a number of other Arab government officials. So you can see that Armenians have much more freedom um, politically speaking, um, within the Arab uh, within the Arab state, than many of the other um, peoples that we've talked about before, such as uh, the Persians or the Levantines or the Egyptians. Then around the year 880. As we've been talking, Armenia ha has been getting more and more power. These princes have becoming more and more uh, independent of the Wali. And so in the year 880, um, uh, Ashot the first, um, uh, sorry, I have a question. Uh, was there a lingua franca? Um, you're talking about a lot of people entering and leaving. Uh, were there enough Latin speakers, perhaps Arabic? Um, I'm speaking rather quickly, but the thing is, is that we're talking about hundreds of years. Um, 
most people in the region were multilingual. Um, Persian was a very common lingua franca in this region. Uh, Arabic was a very common lingua franca in this region when the Arabs had rule over the area. Uh, Latin um, was not used, it would have been Greek. Um, there, uh, there were other church languages like Syriac that people spoke. There, there were, uh, the Caucasus was always a difficult place to communicate in, but a lot of people spoke multiple languages in this region. So communication was not, uh, was not a terrible difficulty. But uh, back to the story, right? So you have this prince from the Bagratunis, and he is and he is able to control a lot of internal policy. And uh, he's threading a balance, a really nice balance between the Byzantine Empire in the west and the uh, Arabs in the south. And as the Arab power is weakening and the Byzantine power is rising, uh, King Ashot sorry, Prince Ashot uh, reaches out to both of them and both of them in order to try and create a vassal state as opposed to, um, as opposed to trying to conquer the region, um, which they know would be difficult. Both the Byzantine ambassador, uh, sorry, the uh, Byzantine ambassador represented by Emperor Basil I and um, representatives of the Abbasid Caliphate rush to give Ashot a crown so that he can make himself king. And so this becomes the first uh, uh, kingdom of Armenia in the last 400 years, um, which is the Bagratud, uh, the Bagratid uh, kingdom run by the Bagratuni family. And so King Ashot um, is able to consolidate his power from 884 to 890, and he manages to take a number of different regions. You can see on the map here, which shows um, his early power period, he took areas in what is today Armenia uh, and Turkey and small parts of Iran and Azerbaijan. Um, this, because of the location of his state directly between the Byzantine Empire and the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, King Ashot, the, uh, Ashot I had to really balance the interests of these two states, um, although he continued to lean slightly more towards uh, the Byzantines. And so we sort of enter a point we've talked about before of the Iranian intermezzo. And so what happened here was that the Abbasid Caliphate became weak enough that a number of Turkish and Persian, sorry, mostly Persian, uh, Persian uh, leaders began to split off from uh, the Abbasid Caliphate's terrestrial control and create their own states, right? So you've got a number of them on this map. You have the, you have the Buyid Emirates, you have the Safavids, you have the Safarids, but what matters to us actually are two dynasties that started in the Caucasus region. There were the Sajids and the Salarids. The Sajids were the earlier of the two. And as you can see from the map, uh, the Sajids um, extended all the way to Lake Vaughan on their Western side and controlled the area around Lake Sevan, which is the main uh, lake in the modern so post-Soviet Armenia. Which, this meant that the Sajids became a direct threat to uh, the Bagratid state. Because if you look at the Bagratid state, it controlled area around Lake Vaughan and just to the north of Lake Sevan. So the Sajids became representative of this Ostikon system. And the, and the Abbasids would use the Sajids to have territorial power over um, the Armenian state, even uh, if the Armenian state was nominally independent. And you can see, even if you look at closely at this Armenian intermezzo map, even by the time of the Salarids, which was in 970, the city of Devin sticks out as the small promontory that the Salarids are able to control uh, because they had their governor still in, in Devin, still exacting tribute from the independent state of Armenia, the, uh, the Bagratid Empire. So we also have a lot of uh, high power politics with the Armenians from the other uh, from the other powerful states in the region. So you have Yusuf ibn uh, Abil Saj, and this, uh, as you can tell from his last name, Abil Saj, he was one of the Sajid rulers. And um, Yusuf wanted to uh, have more leverage and power over um, the Bagratid kingdom, and so he supported 
uh, one of the Artsuruni nobles, right? We've talked about how there are different Nakharars and they come from different families. Well, the Artsurunis wanted to create their own kingdom. And so Yusuf ibn Abi al uh gave power to one of the Artsurunis named Gagik and crowned him as King Gagik of uh, Basburakan, which is to the uh, southern, uh, just to the south of uh, the Bagratid Armenian state. And that became independent in 908. So um, about... 25 to 30 years after King Ashot I um, makes Greater Armenia independent, um, you now have the second Armenian kingdom, right? And this divide between Armenian states allows the Sajids to have a lot more leverage over the, uh, the politics and control of Armenia. During this period, we also have the crystallization or the beginning of the crystallization of Armenian history. Um, and we've already talked about Moses Khorinatsi, um, Mofsis Khoranatsi uh, was in the 5th century, but now uh, we have another historian. Um, in the West, he's known as John V, the historian. Uh, in Armenian, uh, he's Ovanis Draskhanakartsi, and you can see him there. And when uh, Draskhanakartsi moved to um, Vaspurakan, uh, he gave a sense of legitimacy to this second Armenian state, um, resulting in an increased power dynamic between the Bagratid Armenian state, which tended to be a little bit more pro-Byzantine, and the Vaspurakan Armenian state, which tended to be a little bit more pro-Abbasid. Uh, um, this got to the point where when uh, King Ashot II was supposed to take power in 914, there was actually a pretender that was appointed by the Sajids in Dvin, um, uh, and this is King Ashot II of um, Bagratid Armenia, right? Not Vaspurakan, Bagratid Armenia. Um, but the Sajids still had some power there. And so they appointed their own King Ashot, the, uh, the Saparapet, the, sorry, the Sparparet, um, for, uh, I, I wish there were more different names, but unfortunately, um, so King Ashot the Sparparet was seen as a pretender and King Ashot II, Yerkat, Yerkat meaning iron, um, had to go to Constantinople to get a Byzantine army to support him in overthrowing King Ashot and creating a more functional Bagratid state that was increasingly even more independent of the Sajids. Um, and he was able to do this in 916. The way he did this was through getting the Byzantine Empire to create a domestic of schools. Now, a domestic of schools was a military rank in the Byzantine Empire, and that military rank would bring within with him a small army, um, and through that army, he was able. Uh, um, King Ashot II was able to conquer the territory of Armenia back from Ashot the Sparapet. The Sparapet. Um, after he had done this in 916, he had another 13 years of rule in which Arab, uh, in which the Arab states, led by their proxies, right, like the Sajids. Um, and later the Salarids, and even the Byzantines tried to invade and remove him from power. Um, King Ashut II was an incredible military mastermind and was able to defeat each of these attempts and at the same time expand his power base, such that by the time that he was done ruling, um, the area that he controlled was on both sides of Lake Sevan and extended all the way down to Lake Vaughan, um, limiting the territory of Vaspurakan um, in order to consolidate Armenian power. He was succeeded by his brother, Abbas I, and Abbas I surprisingly had very few battles in his reign, but uh, was able to preside over nearly 20 years of, um, of prosperity and growth. We see from this period a large amount of Armenian art produced, and we see um, a large amount of uh, written documentation from the period of Abbas I. But Abbas I really heralds the beginning of the highest point of the Bagratid Kingdom of Armenia, which is led by King Ashot III. And Ashot III um, manages to expand uh, Armenia to its greatest length and incorporates the kingdom of Vaspurakan. So Ashot III uh, has a very interesting idea, which will seem very familiar to us uh, who have seen the Turks, but this is before the Turks have implemented this idea. 
And his idea is that he will divide the larger Bagratid kingdom of Armenia into a number of smaller kingdoms and give those kingdoms uh, to the Nakharars so that that way they can rule over uh, small territories. And at the same time, he would acknowledge himself and, ha and be acknowledged by these kings as the, ki as the primus inter pares, the king of kings, and therefore be able to control all of Armenia. And as long as you had a strong ruler in the center of Armenia, uh, this would work. And so King Ashut III managed to preside over an incredibly powerful uh, Armenian empire. At this same time in the year 961, he develops what is known as the city of 1001 churches, uh, the city of Ani, uh, which sits now on the Turkish side of the Turkish-Armenian border. And uh, that city uh, became the capital of Armenia. It was seen as a very majestic and beautiful city um, and was one of the dominant cities in terms of trade and culture in the Middle Ages, uh, especially in this part of the world. Um, people came from all over to trade in uh, to trade in the city of Ani. Um, and you can see from the stylized picture here uh, a number of different Armenian churches and the Bagratid lion, which was the sort of symbol of the empire. You also have... Uh, in this period, uh, an expansion of the art uh, and uh, other cultural developments that had come during the Abbas, the first period. It was at this point that Armenia uh, was able to even demand tribute from some of the smaller neighboring states, especially like Aran uh, or the Georgian Bagratids. So, um, this is a little bit more in depth of Ani. Uh, you can see in the center sort of an idealized uh, vision of what that city looked like. Uh, it had a large, a large surrounding wall, uh, and you can see the Aras River flowing uh, through the city. Um, the city is on the west bank of the river, and you can see in the picture on the lower right-hand side uh, some of the ruins of the city, and you can see the Aras River is still there. Uh, if you're looking on the near side of the picture where the church is, that is uh, sovereign Turkish territory today. And if you're looking on the far side of the river, that is sovereign Armenian territory today. So you can see how close uh, it is to the current Armenian border. Um, and some uh, some of the churches, their frescoes have survived to a certain degree. You can see um, the pictures on the left-hand side. And in some cases, they have not survived. Um, but it's a ruin that you can visit uh, to this day. Um, but at this time, it was really an incredible power center uh, in, uh, in Armenia. So now we have to sort of realize what's going on with the Byzantine Empire um, towards this uh, kingdom of Armenia. And we saw in some of the previous slides, Emperor John I Simicus. Uh, he's the first one, but there, uh, he's one of these emperors, but there are others as well, such as his predecessor, uh, sorry, so, such as a successor, Emperor Basil II, who ruled for nearly 50 years. Um, and these emperors are not content with the current borders uh, in the Eastern Front that they have. And so they begin an expansionary war against uh, the Armenians, uh, taking uh, their territories. And you can see from the map on the left hand, on the right hand side, uh, that the area of Armenia includes a lot of areas uh, that became part of the Byzantine Empire by the year 1025, and uh, the Byzantines, by expanding their border, now had territory on Lake Vaughan. Um, and, men, and even Ani was just outside of their grasp. They would get it in 1045. When they did this, though, um, they would fight against the individual kings that King Ashot, had Ashot III had created, right? Because Armenia was now all these different little principalities. Um, he was able to fight against one of these principalities or another principality um, and take territories piece by piece. Um, in some cases, the way he, uh, the way that Basil II or uh, Simikas did it before him was to offer the Ar Armenian Nakharars uh, adequate compensation. So uh, one of the kings, for example, uh, was, sorry, one of the princes was uh, Senekirim Hovanes, Artsruni, um, and he was offered to leave his territory um, in exchange for living in the city of Sebastia, modern day Sivas in Turkey, which is further west. And you can see this is his throne um, from the 1800s. Um, 
when Armenians uh, still existed in large numbers in that part of Turkey. So this was the case for a number of Armenian rulers who after uh, either being defeated or in lieu of a fight um, were given territories inside the Byzantine Empire to financially compensate them as their people came under the Byzantine authority. We also see during this point that um, the Armenians are facing threats from the south, and those threats are in the form of new Turkic invaders. Uh, we've seen these Turkic invaders um, in the Islamic history series. We remember that Turks, uh, especially Mamluks, were part of the Abbasid Empire starting as early as the Anarchy of Samara in, in the 860s. But by now, we have Turks that are instantiated in the southern part uh, sorry, the eastern part of the uh, Abbasid Caliphate. Um, we had the Battle of Dandan Khan, fought in 1040 by the Seljuks, but there were already uh, Turkic groups that were in here. And the Turks uh, posed a direct threat uh, to the survival of the Armenian states. And in many cases, it, uh, an, an alliance with the Byzantines um, was more helpful to a lot of these rulers than trying to oppose the Turks on their own. So after the Byzantines had taken the majority of uh, Bagratid territory, they went after the city of Ani, uh, fighting a war for it in 1042 to 1045. Now, the first war that the Byzantines launched against um, Ani was a resounding Armenian defensive success. Um, so uh, Sparapet, um, um, Vahram Pal uh, Pahlevuni, um, the Pahlevuni are another one of these Nakharar families, and Vahram Pahlevuni was uh, the chief military advisor, the uh, Sparapet, uh, sorry, the Sparapet um, of the uh, Bagratid state. He was able to um, fight the Byzantine forces outside of the wall, engage them closely, and defeat them outside of the walls. And so convinced uh, uh, that he could not um, breach the walls of Ani through military force, Emperor Constantine the IX uh, decided to deceive King Gagik II of Bagratid Armenia. What he did was he called um, the king uh, to Constantinople to negotiate a long-term truce, and when he did this, uh, he basically imprisoned him uh, and forced him to sign over the kingdom. Previously, Right, the kings of Ani had met with the Byzantines and had uh, fruitful relations. You can see King Ovani Simbat III uh, in this Byzantine manuscript shaking hands with uh, with uh, the emperor, but um, that completely changed when uh, the Byzantines decided to annex the city um, by taking advantage of their king. So one of the things that we sort of end this period with is that a number of these Bagratid states had slowly become absorbed by the Byzantine Empire, but there was one of these Bagratid principalities that persisted, and that was the Principality of Artsakh. So Artsakh at that time uh, was composed of several different territories, um, but in terms of modern parlance, the biggest territories that it, that it composed were Sunik or Zangizur region, and um, the uh, mountainous Karabakh region. Um, and so those regions uh, became joint, uh, those became the principality of Artsakh. And after the Bagratid uh, kingdom fell, it was the last real Armenian state uh, in the region. We don't actually know much of the history about what happened uh, in that area. Um, it alternates between the names Artsakh and Khachen, um, but we really don't hear much until the rule of Hassan, Jalalia, uh, Hassan Jalal. Um, and so when he comes up, uh, I'll get to that history. So uh, between 950 and 1045, we have large waves of Armenian migrations in the Byzantine Empire further west than the Armenian homeland. And they sort of migrate in sort of three different categories of people. The first one, as we sort of pointed out, are those who migrated to Constantinople. And they migrated to Constantinople because that was the center of business, uh, development, economic uh, growth within the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire was growing immensely. During the reign of uh, Tsimikis 
and uh, Basil II, the empire more than doubled in size. And so there was lots of uh, space for the Armenians to now become part of that empire. To that point, you have the lower arrow, um, which points towards the Mediterranean Sea. And a lot of Armenians um, were deported from their lands uh, between the year 900 and 1050 um, to populate these areas that the Byzantine Empire had recovered from the Arab states. As we moved into uh, the late 900s and early thousands, the Byzantines were making fine, uh, incredible strides against the Arab states, which as we pointed out, had been in the intermezzo period, um, which was when the Abbasids were losing their power um, to the Persians in the East. And uh, accordingly, their areas in, in what's now Syria, um, southeastern Turkey, these areas were now up for grabs um, in, in a way that they had never been before. So the Byzantine rise and the Arab fall meant that numerous cities came under Byzantine control and they deported populations from all over the empire in order to fill these cities with people. Armenians were no exception to this. In fact, uh, they were disproportionately represented among the populations that were deported to these regions. And then of course, the middle arrow uh, shows what we had discussed before, where several of the Nakharars of, uh, the, uh, that had formed these various principalities in Armenia were resettled further west in the empire and therefore away from the border regions where, uh, where the Byzantines could resettle uh, peoples that they considered to be more loyal to them and less, uh, and less, uh, and less um, problematic if the Turks should invade. Um, you can see in the upper right-hand side, um, one of the Byzantine invasions, the Byzantines uh, launched uh, a war against Aleppo. They were not able to take Aleppo in, uh, in 962. They, they, had, they didn't hold it for long, but they did hold a lot of areas along the Mediterranean coast. And you can see um, Antioquia, you can see Adana. Um, these areas came under Byzantine control and were increasingly populated by Armenian uh, minorities. We also begin to see, and this was something that we sort of picked up on, but we didn't really address uh, in large scale. Um, we begin to see Armenians outside of historic Armenia in a much broader sense, right? We saw the Armenian migrations in the Byzantine Empire to areas that were not historically Armenian, but Egypt is far, far away from the areas uh, where we expect Armenian settlement. And what ends up happening here is that towards the end of the Bagratid Armenian phase, um, there begins to be a tribute of Armenians uh, to the Arab states. Um, and this is very similar to what would eventually become the Devshirme system uh, in the Ottoman Empire or the, or the Kurche system in the Safavid Empire, where Armenians um, are deported and brought into an, uh, a Muslim-run state because they have no allegiance to anybody in that state. And they are uh, slave soldiers, Mamluks. Um, and so we see these Mamluks developing in Egypt um, during the Fatimid period. And increasingly, the Armenian Mamluks in the Fatimid period uh, acquire more and more power. So the first Armenian that we know, uh, the first Armenian Mamluk that we know that actually came to power directly in Fatimid Egypt was Badr al-Jamali. And he ruled from 1063 till 1094, sorry, 1063 to 1073. Um, and uh, uh, we don't know much about his childhood, but we know that he was an Armenian slave that was taken to Egypt, uh, raised by the Fatimid Caliph, and then made Grand Vizier of the country. In his role as Grand Vizier, he effectively had more control than the Caliph had, um, the, Fatimid, uh, the Fatimid Caliph had, and his son, Alafdal, um, Alafdal Shahanshah, who was now half Armenian, um, continued to rule the Fatimid state. So you had um, both of these men, however, Badr al-Jamali and al Abdul Shah Shah were Muslim. Badr al-Jamali, when he became a Mamluk, was forcibly converted. Um, and as a sign of his Islamic faith, he, re he was responsible for the construction of Al-Juyushi Mosque, which you can see there, uh, it still survives in Egypt to this day. Um, one interesting thing of note is that Alaf al Shahan Shah is indirectly responsible for creating an entire sect of Islam. Um, the Fatimids who ruled um, in Egypt uh, 
had a succession issue uh, between two sons. Um, and Alaf al Shah and Shah chose the younger son because he believed he could manipulate that son. The older son, Nizar, um, struck out um, and tried to take control. Alaf al Shah and Shah put him down, uh, which resulted in him fleeing to Iran and creating uh, the Nizari Ismailis, the, the uh, order that created the assassins. We've discussed them uh, in previous uh, conversations. Um, but it's sort of an interesting thing to imagine that some, uh, that, um, an Armenian was responsible for cr the creation of Nizari uh, Ismaili uh, Shiism uh, indirectly by choosing a different successor than the one that the other Ismailis would have chosen for themselves. So now we have the entry of probably the most um, famous interloper in Armenian history. We have the, the Turks really arriving um, into Anatolia. Um, They've previously come from Central Asia. Um, they're lead, they're, uh, this is an Oghuz Turkish tribe and their, their progenitor is Seljuk Bey. But by the time that they get to Eastern Anatolia, uh, it's taken up by his um, two sons, uh, Tughril and Chagre Bey. Uh, and um, Tughril is the one who leads the majority of the invasion. Um, and we have Armenian resistance to these Turkish invasions. So it's not just the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. The Turks had come in waves trying to attack um, uh, the, the areas of Armenia. Um, we have a battle uh, in 1054 um, where Tughril, um is fighting against uh, the Sparapet um, Tatul uh, Vanadetsi and he takes Vanadetsi captive. Um, this is an apocryphal story in 1054 um, that uh, Tughril says to Vanadetsi, um, I will release you if uh, my prisoner comes back. Um, and uh, Vanadetsi says, don't bother. Uh, he, you know, if he was run through with my spear, he'll never recover. And that's what happened. The, the other captive died. And so Vanadetsi was executed. You also have Alparslan, Al who's the son of Tughril, um, leading the sack of Ani in 1064. Um, and his troops marched through the porous Byzantine borders um, and sacked Ani, which had been now in Byzantine control for 19 years, um, which is why the city is a ruin today. Um, uh, Armenians from Ani uh, fled uh, westward further into the Byzantine empire um, in advance of the Turkish armies. Now, the Battle of Manzikert was a hugely pivotal battle, but the reason uh, for the Turkic success in this battle has to do a lot more with Byzantine internal politics than it does with um, unique strategies of the Turks. Now, of course, the Turks had practiced what they called the faint retreat, which is where they used their light cavalry and they would retreat first and create distance between the frontline uh, troops and the command structure further back. Then once the frontline troops were isolated enough, they would turn around and attack those frontline troops. And this was very successful, um, leading to the ability for uh, the Seljuks to crush um, both uh, the right side, uh, crush the right side flank, then uh, encircle the center, which included the emperor himself. You can see where I've circled it in the picture. That's where the uh, where Emperor Romanos IV of uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, was uh, was situated, and the rear guard led by Andronikos Dukas actually retreated uh, because that he had a personal conflict with uh, the Emperor Romanos. When Alparslan had defeated the Varangian guard that was surrounding um, uh, Emperor Romanos, uh, he. Uh, in, he actually captured the emperor and ransomed him uh, back to the Byzantine Empire. There's a famous line that the Turks recall, which is that when Alparslan uh, got Emperor Romanus, he said, Emperor, what would you do if you were in my place? And he said, I would kill you. And Alparslan said, I'll do you, I'll do you one worse. I'll let you live, right? Because of course he would live with the humiliation that he'd been so defeated by the Turks. So, 
when the Turks moved into Anatolia, and you can see how quickly they did this, right? Between the maps of 1072 on the left-hand side and 1075 on the right-hand side, almost all of Anatolia comes under Turkey control. And certainly all of Armenia is under Turkey control. Um, they did this by uh, creating the Eksas system, which apportioned land uh, into different small states, uh, similar to what we had talked about with, uh, with Armenia. And this Ektas system resulted in Turkic warlords establishing themselves as leaders of small principalities, um, swearing loyalty to uh, the great Seljuk, who would be the leader of all Turks. So I just wanted to sort of as a reprise, go back over um, what, uh, well, both as a reprise and looking forward, um, what Armenia looks like. So if we look at 970 CE, we still have a kingdom of Armenia. We have the kingdom of Vespurakon. We have uh, a number of different Armenian states that are sort of in confederation there. By 1094, right after the battle, of, uh, about 10 years after the battle of Manzikert, we have no Armenian states anymore. Um, by 1157, we're going to start to have a new Armenian state. Right here, it's, it's classified as um, a crusader state, which is not an unfair characterization. It's um, and in the last one, you have 1175, where you can see um, the area of Taurus is controlled uh, by the Byzantine Empire um, because the Armenian state of Cilicia had been uh, repressed at that time. And to take a closer view, you can sort of see that all of historic Armenia was under different types of Seljuk control, all of these microstates run by different Turkic leaders, all swearing loyalty to the great Seljuk. And you can see by those orange lines, those orange lines are the edges of Seljuk control. All of the areas of Armenia are under Seljuk control. Um, this is sort of what we talked about a little bit uh, when it came to the sects of Christianity. Um, you can see the great, uh, the great Schism, how all the different uh, churches separated. Um, if you follow the purple, the purple is the Oriental Orthodox, which is uh, among which uh, are counted the Armenians. And so they split off from the early church in 451. And the, and the Chalcedonian church continues from that, uh, that break, uh, leading to the Eastern Orthodox and Catholic churches. And the Catholic Church, of course, splits in at the Reformation into uh, the Protestant churches, just so we have sort of a headspace about how this all this all these church uh, churches split. But one of the interesting things that you can see here are these dotted lines. If you look closely um, at the yellow and uh, purple lines, you can see that they have a dotted line, um, and it connects back to some of the red lines where it says the Eastern Rites. Now, this is sort of an interesting thing, which is that the Catholic Church will accept if a non if a church that is has rejected Catholic teaching creates a rapprochement, they will accept them as part of the Catholic Church. And that has happened for the Nestorian Church, right, which has created the Chaldean Catholic Church. There's an Armenian Catholic Church on the same grounds today. Um, there are Byzantine Catholics on the same grounds today. There were these unions um, of church synods with the Catholic Church, and that resulted of um, uh, these resulted in uh, these groups being recognized as Catholics. Um, uh, the question on uh, percentage of Armenians in Cilicia will we'll get to that. All right. So during this point in 1054, right, we, we sort of breezed by it, right, when we went to the Battle of Manzikert in 1071, but we have this great schism in 1054 between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, the Eastern Orthodox Church had never been terribly accommodating of Armenian religion. Armenians were generally uh, either taxed or prevented from building new churches uh, if they were outside of Bagratid Armenia, but the split between East and West meant that um, there was now a new Christian center that the Armenians could appeal to. It wasn't just Constantinople, um, and the Pope would have his own agency in relations with Armenia. So as we mentioned, Armenians had migrated 
through the empire. And so you get to this point um, in the late 1000s where either a significant minority or the majority of the population surrounding the Mediterranean Sea in this uh, in the province that's labeled there as Adana, number 33, um, those are Armenians in that province. So you begin to have um, different uh, leaders within the Byzantine Empire beginning to fight for their own independence in that region. So one, partic one, one particular example is Filaretos Brachamios, um, who's known in Armenian as Vahram Barajnoni. Um, and Filaretos Brachamios was one of these deacons, uh, one, sorry, uh, one, one of these uh, Ar uh, Byzantine military leaders. Um, and he manages to create his own dukedom um, that controls some of the area around Antioch, up the coast, and around um, the uh, Euphrates River. You can see it on the map below. Um, Filaretos Brachamios was not known as the most accommodating and lovely individual, um, and he attracted um, antagonism from both Sultan Malik Shah of the Seljuks and from um, other Syrian, uh, other Turks based in Syria that uh, ended up overthrowing his country in 1085. Um, the Byzantines also fought against him uh, when he refused to recognize their sovereignty. You also have um, the uh, beginning uh, beginnings of, uh, sorry, you have the beginnings of Armenians uh, beginning to work for the independence of a state after Filaretos um, in the south uh, part of Turkey, where it's labeled here Armenian Cilicia. Of course, this is Armenian Cilicia at its largest borders, but you can see that these states are much further west of uh, Bagratid Armenia um, and historic Armenia, uh, but because of the migrations of the Armenian people, there were significant uh, populations of Armenians here. Some may even say the majority of the population in this region because this region had been resettled uh, when the Byzantines conquered it. So a couple things that I wanna point out when it comes to geography. Um, if we look at the Southern part of Anatolia, we have this Taurus mountain range that cuts across that area and creates a real barrier to entry um, if you're coming from the North. The one exception is where I've circled just north of the S, which is called the Gates of Cilicia, which is a mountain pass that you can use to enter the territory. Um, once you get to the southeast of the Gates of Cilicia, you have a plains region, which is really great for growing um, wheat and other kinds of crops. And so you can sustain a large population in this area south of the mountains. The other circle there um, I put, because we're gonna see the sea fort of uh, Coricos, and that sea fort is within that circle area. So, right, you have these massive Taurus mountains and you have the Cilician Gates, um, which was really the only entryway making this area incredibly defensible. You have um, castles built all throughout the mountains uh, by Armenians. You can see this is a castle near, uh, near the former Armenian city of Sis which is known today as um, Karaman. No, sorry. No, sorry, it's known as, uh, sorry, it's known as Marash, uh, Kahran Marash. Um, and uh, you can see the Armenian, Kal uh, uh, well, I can't pronounce anything today. Uh, Cilician Armenian uh, Catholic estate. Um, that was where the Armenian Catholicos the head of the Armenian religion uh, operating in Cilicia was based. And this was a picture from 1914. Um, of course, after that year, uh, the Armenian uh, Catholic estate no longer existed um, for, re for reasons connected to the genocide. You can also see the sea castle of Korikos. Originally, this was a Byzantine structure, but as the Armenians expanded their power in Cilicia, they took over this fortress and it became one of their most uh, famous fortresses. It takes up almost the entirety of this three kilometer square island. And um, yeah, it still remains to this day. So when we talk about Cilician Armenia, we're first talking about um, a dukedom within the Byzantine Empire. Uh, Reuben I, Lord of Cilicia, declares himself prince 
but he does, and he asserts independence, but he still pays tribute to the Byzantine Empire, right? And you can see that there's a border between the Byzantines uh, and his state. Um, his state is just the red area, uh, but the Byzantines controlled the coast and uh, sort of those orangish areas. Um, eventually, the state would expand to the coast, um, but because it was situated in the mountains. Um, Reuben I was able to consolidate power and build several castles, um, in addition to the ones he took, like uh, Barzabert Castle. Um, um, yeah. And so he was able to create for the first time this, uh, this uh, principality of Cilicia. Now, at the same time that Reuben is operating, um, about 10, 15 years later, we have the beginnings of the Crusades, right? We have Pope Urban II at the Council of Clermont, we have uh, leading a crusade. We first have the People's Crusade, which is an abysmal failure. But then we have uh, the crusade, the Knights Crusades, the Princes Crusades, which start in Constantinople and have two major victories at Nicaea and Doileum in 1097. And then after that, they managed to make their way to Cilician Armenia. Uh, you can see the map on the right-hand side um, where they, uh, they enter Cilician Armenia. Um, and they are replenished by the Armenians uh, who live there. The prince of Armenia reaches out to uh, the Pope and signals his willingness to have an alliance with the Catholic Church against, uh, against the Muslims. And this Armenian, um, Ar this Armen Armeno Crusader relations uh, gets taken to another level when one of the leading knights in the crusade which is uh, Baldwin, um, comes to the city of Edessa, which is a city with a majority Armenian population. Edessa is the city of Urfa in Turkey today. Um, and this city, as I said, has, an, has a majority Armenian population, but because it was integrated into the Byzantine Empire, its ruler is, a, is an Eastern Orthodox uh, Armenian, meaning that he believes in the Byzantine Eastern Orthodox Church, but he's ethnically Armenian, which makes him deeply unpopular. And this is Toros of Edessa. Um, so when Baldwin comes in, uh, the fact that he is Catholic uh, means that he is supported by the Armenians in overthrowing uh, this Byzantine appointed leader, Toros. And uh, Baldwin is given uh, the keys to the city by uh, the Armenian clergy in 1098. And he declares himself Baldwin, uh, the Count of Edessa. Um, and the County of Edessa survives from 1098 until 1144. It's the first crusader state to form and the first crusader state to be lost. But what's important to point out here is that with, at, just like most crusader states, but especially this is the case for Edessa, the majority of the population was not crusader. Uh, the majority of the population was local peoples. And so... Um, the Catholic alliance with the Armenians was absolutely critical to maintaining control over the county of Edessa um, because the Armenians were the largest single um, group in the region. Um, and so by the end of uh, the First Crusade, the Crusaders had established four distinct states, right? They established Edessa. Antioch, Tripoli, and Jerusalem. And the Armenians were part and parcel of all of these states. That said, the, the way that they had struck the deal in Edessa was not the way that they were able to strike a deal in any of the other crusader states. And so in each of these crusader states, Armenians were seen as less than Latin Christians, despite them being seen as more than non-Christians. Um, we have negotiations between the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the Principality of Armenia concerning the uh, concerning how Armenians should be viewed in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, especially because uh, Armenian Cilicia wanted to send a delegation uh, to uh, to Jerusalem for religious reasons, and uh, the Kingdom of Jerusalem uh, explained that they would have to pay a dime or a small tax um, because they were not Latin Christians. At the same time, as Cilicia um, was getting more and more uh, freedom, uh, the Byzantines were unhappy 
with the way that their dukedom was increasingly showing uh, signs of independence. So jo Emperor John II Komnenos um, began an expansionist war where he conquered uh, Armenia, uh, Cilician Armenia, and he did this by taking Prince Leo I uh, and putting him in chains. Um, uh, when I say that, I mean that uh, John II Komnenos had invited Leo I to discuss policy with him in Constantinople, and in so doing, uh, he imprisoned Leo I. Uh, as just like with King Gagik, we uh, the second we have this uh, act where the Byzantine emperor um, uh, deceives the ruler of an Armenian region, and then proceeds to take their territory. And so by 1142, um, John II Komnenos had controlled all of uh, Cilician Armenia and was trying to extend his power further south um, into um, territory that was either allied with the Crusader states or um, sorry, part of the Crusader states are part of the enemies of the Crusader states. So you have, for example, John II uh, launching the uh, siege of Shaizar in 1138. Um, but uh, while his Byzantine troops are very active in trying to take down the fortress, uh, the troops from the county of Edessa, which were there, um, only participated nominally and did not seem very interested. The same with those from Antioch those two principalities had much better relations with the Armenians than they had with the Byzantines um, because of the Armeno Crusader relationship. We then deal with the story of Toros the Great. Um, Toros the Great um, was living in exile. He had been imprisoned by the Byzantines with his father, Leo I, but he managed to take a boat that would sneak him into, uh, sneak him into Syria. And from and once he got to Syria, he was able to get to the county of Edessa, and from there, um, fight to take back Armenian Cilicia from the successor of John II Komnenos. And he managed to do this. Um, and you would think, of course, now that he would be at risk of war from the Seljuks, but it turns out that. Um, the Seljuk leader at the time, Kilij Arslan II, was actually really enamored with Toros of Edessa, uh, with Toros the Great, and so created an alliance with him. The two of them managed uh, the two of them managed to avoid each other in conflict because the Seljuk sultans in Anatolia, these this is now the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, uh, are no longer interested in the politics of the lower Middle East. Right, the area of Syria and the area of the Levant is not their concern. So we then have uh, King Toros, sorry, Prince Toros, aligning himself with the Crusader states of Antioch and, um, and Edessa, uh, yeah, Antioch and Edessa, and performing numerous raids against Muslims uh, in the region. You also have wars against the Byzantines in the region, such as the sack of Cyprus in 1156. But um, there becomes an incredible amount of coordination between three people, Toros um, and the Crusaders Reynald de Chatillon and uh, Bohemond III of Antioch. All three of these people um, perform raids uh, against Muslim states, especially um, as we get closer and closer to, uh, to this time, uh, the rule of Nur ad-Din Zengi, um, which we've talked about on the Crusader side, who is really the biggest threat to um, an independent, uh, yeah, to, to the Crusader kingdoms because it was a unified Muslim resistance in what's now Syria and Jordan. Also, it's worth noting that uh, Edessa falls in 1146, which ends that part of the relationship. Edessa is conquered by Nur ad-Din Zengi. So as we move towards Saladin taking power, we see that Saladin is able to conquer nearly all of the Crusader states. You can see a little bit left of Antioch, a little bit left of Tripoli, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem only controls the city-state of Tyre. Um, the Armenians still continue to try and support uh, the Crusader states, uh, but it was looking increasingly great for them. When the Third Crusaders came through, the Cilician Armenians supported them uh, uh, 
these were the uh, the ones led by uh, Barbarossa, um, Frederick II Barbarossa, uh, Emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor um, Empire. And he gave them food as well as military training and sent an Armenian uh, military delegation with them. Unfortunately, um, Frederick II Barbarossa um, had issues crossing the river between uh, Armenia and Cilicia and Antioch, and he died because he couldn't swim. Fellow, uh, the, sec the Holy Roman Emperor that succeeded him didn't honor his uh, treaty with the uh, Cilician Armenians, and this uh, resulted in antagonism um, on the Armenian side. Now, we've seen this sort of push and pull between the Byzantines uh, and uh, Cilician Armenia, with Cilician Armenia not entirely declaring uh, separation from the Byzantine Empire, but Levon II in 1198 decides to openly declare Cilician Armenia as an independent state. So one of the ways that he's able to do this is by getting a, a crown from the Pope. Now, one of the things in order to guarantee that you had an actual independent kingdom was that you had uh, a crown given to you by a legal and respected um, Christian authority. And so relations with the Pope were critical in securing him that crown because the relations with the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantines were never going to give him a crown. The separation between East and West uh, allowed uh, him to petition for that from the Pope. So in so doing, um, he begins to try and reconcile with the Catholic Church. It doesn't end up working, it doesn't end up holding, but it works for long enough for King Levon to be crowned the first king of Armenia. Um, and he manages to inculcate strong alliances, um, not just with uh, Antioch, but with the Knights Hospitalier and the Teutonic Order, um, in many cases, giving gifting them territories along their shared border. He also leads a number of military campaigns um, through uh, some of the Muslim allies um, in the region. Uh, one of these was uh, Bagra's castle, which had been taken by Saladin. He managed to take the castle back. Um, and he also managed um, to scare off a number of uh, invasions from the uh, from from Saladin, from the Ayyubids, um, that would otherwise have compromised the region. But he knew that he did not have enough strength to direct, directly attack the Ayyubids head on, um, I, the Ayyubids being the, uh, the dynasty of Saladin. He knew that he didn't have the ability to attack them head on. The Crusaders were a little bit more headstrong, and this resulted uh, in negative outcomes for the Crusaders and hurting their long-term viability. At the same time, King Levon uh, opened up Cilicia um, because he had conquered the coastline, he was able to allow for an influx of merchants and traders. And so Venetians and Genoese, among others, began to settle uh, in uh, Armenian Cilicia and created their own quarters uh, where they were able to conduct trade and live according to their own customs. This brought incredible wealth to Cilicia and made the region very prosperous. At the same time that the Byzantine Empire is waning um, and Armenian Cilicia is growing, um, we also have the growth of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome, which finally conquers Antalya, and um, which means that the Byzantine Empire and the uh, and the uh, Armenians no longer share a border. And this helps to secure Armenian independence. As you can see, the border of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome follows the uh, the Caucasus Mount. Uh, sorry, the Taurus Mountains, meaning that uh, Cilician Armenia remains independent. You can see in the upper right hand side, uh, Kizilkule, which is a Turkish fortress that was built in uh, in Alanya uh, along this southern coast. Now, because of the relationships between the Armenians and the Crusaders, a number of the titles over the Kingdom of Armenia uh, in Cilicia uh, had passed to Crusaders. So we had, for example, John of Brienne, 
um, who were, who is going to be detailed much more on the Crusader side. But it's just important to note that during the Fifth Crusade, um, there was a succession issue in Armenia. And since he was nominally the king of Armenia by this time, um, he had to abandon the Fifth Crusade to deal with problems in Armenia uh, and then come back a year later. It's not the only reason the Fifth Crusade failed, but it's one of them. Now, we then begin to see Mongols uh, entering Anatolia. And the first time that they do is in 1231. The Mongols who enter here are chasing Jalaluddin Magburni, who we've seen before. He was the leader of the Khwarezmian Empire in Eastern Persia. And every time the Mongols had beaten him, he retreated west. And so he retreated west until he came to historic Armenia. And in historic Armenia, that is where Shormakan uh, defeated him. Now, when the Mongols showed up in Anatolia, um, they, uh, of course, as is typical, they committed a number of massacres. But the Armenians took the step of immediately sending uh, messages to the Mongols that they submitted and that they would be vassals to uh, the Mongols. And not only that, they would encourage others to do so as well. So in 1247, um, King Hetum I of Armenia uh, sent emissaries to uh, the Great Khan um, in order to create an alliance between the Armenians and the Mongols. Um, the Georgians followed suit, like Armenian Cilicia. And in 1254, King Hetum I himself went to Karakoram and struck his own agreement uh, that would allow for the Armenians to continue practicing their religion, uh, to not be directly occupied by Mongol forces as long as they brought our Cilician knights to war on behalf of the Mongol sovereign. In the battle, um, and so the Armenians fought on the side of the Mongols in several other uh, wars and campaigns uh, that the Mongols fought in Anatolia, especially against the Turks. Uh, the most important one, of course, was the Battle of Kazidag, or the Battle of Hairy Beard, where uh, Armenians fought um, on the Mongol side. Interestingly enough, there were crusaders who fought on the Turkish side because they were paid mercenaries. And so you can see, even at the greatest extent of the Mongol Khanate, uh, in Anatolia, Cilicia remained at least nominally independent because of their suzerainty to the Mongols. Of course, the, because they were uh, suzerains uh, under the Mongols, they were required to field soldiers in the Mongol advances down the Levant region. And so when the Mongols besieged Aleppo in 1260, uh, when they fought in Damascus, um, there were Armenian forces alongside uh, the Mongols. Um, and uh, Antioch had also submitted as an ally of the Mongols as a vassal state. And so there were Antiochians as well, uh, crusaders from Antioch. There are stories, we don't know how apocryphal they are, of um, three Christians, one being um, King Hetum I of Armenia, one being um, King uh, King Bohemond, I think it's the point, King Bohemond IV of Antioch, and um, Ketbuka uh, of the Mongols, who is also Christian. Uh, these three Christians uh, marching into the Great Mosque in Damascus um, and proceeding to profane it. Um, there are different, there, are, but this story is most likely apocryphal. The Armenians were not involved, however, in the Battle of Angelut, which was an entirely Mongol affair. Uh, where, the Mong where the Mongols were defeated by the Egyptian-based Mamluks. Now, we've avoided talking about Artsakh because we really don't know much until the reign of Hassan Jalal, who reigned from 1215 to 1261. So now this is the right time to talk about him because we moved into the 13th century. Um, Hassan Jalal um, was a builder of... Uh, of the largest uh, monastery in uh, in Artsakh region, that uh, which is the region uh, Hachen, which he controlled, which was Gonzasar Monastery, and Gonzasar became the Catholicos of the Albanian Church. Now, of course, as we pointed out, the Albanian Church was subordinated to the Armenian Church by this period, and so we have numerous carvings across the church 
uh, in Armenian writing. Um, and we also have recognition, for example, on his flag, the flag of Khachen. Um, we have the Armenian alphabet. And it's notable um, because Meshrop Mashtots, uh, the, the person who we talked about invented the Armenian alphabet, he also invented an Albanian alphabet. So if, we, if it had been written in Albanian, uh, we would have, it would be in Albanian letters. Now, Hassan Jalal was the last remaining Armenian uh, leader of a free independent Armenian state, other than those in Cilicia. Um, certainly the only independent Armenian leader in the, in the lands of historic Armenia. And he petitioned the Mongols repeatedly uh, for, uh, for a vassal state, and he managed to get that until 1261, when he met with uh, Argon, who was head of the Mongol Ilkhanat, that, that was the Persian Mongol Empire, and uh, they imprisoned him, tortured him, and hacked him to pieces. But his descendants uh, created a dynasty of rulers uh, of this region uh, called the Hassan Jalalian dynasty, and they continued to rule until the mid 1600s. Now, despite the fact that they continued to rule, um, this mountainous region divided into five separate kingdoms. Uh, and that's where this term Melikdom comes from, Melik being king, right? So these were five independent kingdoms. Um, and you can see them on the map here, Gyulistan, Drarabert, uh, Hachen, Varand, and Dizak. And these five Melikdoms together um, were roughly analogous to the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh Nagorno -Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, which you can see in black uh, placed on top of it, even though that it's, it's anachronous for the time period. Um, now, when Timur comes in, Timur engages in numerous massacres of the local Armenian population when he conquers Greater Armenia. Um, as far as I know, he doesn't actually go to Armenian Cilicia, um, but Armenian Cilicia by this point had been conquered by the Mamluks, who by the mid 1300s had taken over large swaths of territory and Tamerlan was coming at the beginning of the 1400s. So once Armenian Cilicia was defeated in 1375, the only Armenian state that survived was the five Melikdoms. Um, which were incredibly weak. And to the degree that they were independent, um, we also have to recognize that they were paying tribute to whoever was ruling in Persia. And that would keep changing, right? Because the Ilkhanat was replaced by, an, uh, by the Chopanids. The Chopanids were replaced by Timur. Timur was replaced by the Safavids. Um, and sorry, by the, by the Black Sheep Turks and the White Sheep Turks. So they would keep paying whoever these sovereigns were, but... Um, they didn't have complete and total independence, but they had a significant degree of independence. And in Khachen, uh, because they had independence, Christianity was the dominant religion, religion of the region. Elsewhere in this uh, area, in the historic area of Armenia and in Cilicia, Islam is now the dominant religion, uh, politically speaking. And you can see on this map, the area that used to belong to Cilicia is now controlled by the Ramazanid uh, Turkic state. So when we have this period where the Armenians are no longer a political force um, in any meaningful sense, um, we begin to see the creation of new Catholicosates um, that somehow bridge the divide between where Armenian Cilicia was and where Greater Armenia is. Um, and so the area around Ligvon in particular becomes sort of a focal point of Armenian cultural life to the to the extent that it that it continues to exist and so we have um the uh catholicos zakaria the third that is not an actual picture of the, of that catholicos but it's a picture of one of his successors uh catholicos zakaria the third really uh brings life to Akhtamar. Akhtamar being one of the islands inside of lake vaughn you can see the mountains surrounding uh the lake from the from the monastery you can see on the left hand side um and Akhtamar becomes a center of uh, Armenian cultural life. We have numerous texts being uh, written and translated here. We have um, art, almost all of it, uh, ecclesiastical art uh, coming out of Akhtamar. Um, and the Armenian community is primarily defined 
either religiously through its connection to the church or um, through its position relative to the Ottoman government. Because, uh, because increasingly the Ottoman government is taking over these areas, especially as we get into uh, the mid 1400s. When we look at, uh, and the big, uh, sorry, we also begin to see large numbers of disruptions uh, in Armenian communal life that occur as tangential effects of larger scale disunities within, uh, within the Ottoman Empire. And we haven't gotten to this yet on the Ottoman Empire side, but I'll discuss it more there when we do. Um, we have the Jalali revolts, which occur throughout Eastern Anatolia. And these revolts are revolts by Turkic uh, leaders for a variety of different reasons against the Ottoman sultans. And these are Muslim on Muslim wars. They don't involve the Armenians in terms of uh, them having a stake in which side is winning. They're, the Armenians not supporting one side or, over the other, but it happens that almost all of these revolts happen in areas where Armenians are densely packed and highly populous. Um, and so Armenians suffer immensely because of these Jalali revolts, um, creating a lot of uh, havoc in the area. It's important to also note that we've shifted from arrows and crossbows um, to musket loading rifles. So the number of casualties from these encounters and also artillery batteries. So the numbers of deaths from these encounters is increasingly high, especially since many of the Jalali who were involved in these revolts had been part of the Ottoman Janissary Corps or had been part uh, another part of the Ottoman military. So they had access to advanced weaponry um, and it was not just small localized revolts. We also see that deportation is alive and well in the Ottoman Empire. Um, it's the same policy as the Byzantines did. When Mehmet II conquered Constantinople in 1453, there was an Armenian community there, but a very small one. Um, and Mehmet II also noticed that the city had a population capacity of about 500,000 people, but only about 50,000 were living in the city, which meant that there were large sections that were empty. And as he wanted to turn this into his capital, he deported populations from all around, uh, all around the Armenian Empire, sorry, all around the Ottoman Empire to uh, Constantinople, including the Armenians, um, Greeks, and Jews. Um, and he appointed, and eventually he appointed to lead the, Arme uh, the Armenian community, um, um, uh, millet Bashi, or the head of the uh, the millet or group, um, and that was Hovakim the first. So, um, just a few a few points. Um, then uh, you had the rise of the Black Sheep Turks, and while you had some like Kara Yusuf and Jahan Shah, who were uh, very positive influences on the Armenians, you had between them Kara Iskender. Uh, who performed numerous Armenian massacres. With the rise of the Safavids um, and the Safavid expansion over almost all of territorial Armenia, you had increasing repression uh, against the Armenians then. Um, and this resulted in a large Armenian exodus from the region, um, which is why there are, uh, there are Armenian communities now um, in the Low Countries. And you can see this is actually a painting from uh, from Flemish artists about 400 years ago, uh, showing the Armenian community in Bruges um, among all other um, local uh, low country people. Both the Armenian, uh, both the Safavids and the Ottomans when they went to war with each other, uh, went to war in the territory of greater Arme of, of historic Armenia. And um, they, and the Safavids in particular pursued a scorched earth policy um, destroying all of the land in advance of the Ottomans taking it, um, which ruined Armenia uh, for the local population that was living there. We also know that this con these conflicts went back and forth a number of times, especially in the 16th century, with the city of Ed uh, with the city of Yerevan today being conquered and unconquered 26 times, um, which was incredibly difficult. All right. The last sort of note is that, as I mentioned before, um, the Safavids began to attack Armenia and enslave Armenians to bring into their Kurchi system, which was uh, they, can, they were forcibly converted to Islam and made the royal guards in opposition to the Kizil Bash. We talked about this more 
during the Safavid presentation. There were wars throughout Armenia in the Safavid period. Uh, and the most deadly, of course, was that um, in 1604, where Shah Abbas relocated the city of Julfa, uh, which was an Armenian city in what's now Azerbaijan. Um, and he relocated the population to Isfahan. Um, significant percentages of Armenians died en route. Um, they couldn't ford the river Aras. Um, and it was in the middle of the winter in the high mountains. You can imagine the conditions. The Armenians have a were, that did make it were resettled in Isfahan and do remain there to this day. You can see the Armenian cathedral in Isfahan in the upper right-hand side. And Armenians continued to contribute to the Safavid Empire when they were there. You can see um, Khachatur Kasaratsi, who was an Armenian based in Isfahan, um, who was the first Safavid to use a printing press, per person in the Safavid Empire to use a printing press. Um, and Armenians, because of their Christian nature and because of stretching across multiple uh, countries, were able to be interlocutors in large scale trade along the Silk Road uh, between Safavid Persia and Ottoman and the Ottoman Empire without arousing the suspicions of either, while Sunni or Shiite Muslims uh, would respectively be a problem in the country of the other. And that's that's my spiel for tonight. So any, any last uh, questions before we sort of wrap up? Okay, I guess everybody's asleep. Um, next week um, in this uh, series, there is going uh, we're going to go back to our normally uh, our, our normal trajectory, which will cover Suleiman the Magnificent, um, who was Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and that will be at seven p.m. Eastern time next uh, next Tuesday. Um, Zach, do you want to make any announcements? Richard, I have a couple questions. How did you oh, get started um, learning about this history? And then how long will the series run till? Like what, what will some future topics, you, you said at the beginning, this was one of many that you've done. Like what will be some other ones that'll be coming up in the future? Sure, uh, just give me a second, I have a list. But generally speaking, my goal is to get to the 21st century um, and sort of track the development of um, the Middle East up, up till now. Um, oh, okay, but, awesome. Which which is a lot uh, which is a lot of ground to cover because as we move closer and closer to the modern era, there's much more going on in a lot shorter amount of time. So, um, I'm going to uh, uh, sorry, just give me a second. Let me share my screen. So, um. This started from the beginning, and this is the series as it started in 2022. Uh, so we have the Safavids, Ancient Armenia, Medieval Armenia, which is today. Um, then we have Suleiman next week, the Sultanate of Women after him, the Caprile Viziers, uh, which is when uh, Albanians ruled the Ottoman Empire, uh, the wars with Russia, Balkan nationalism, because that, that has a huge effect on the Middle East, even though it's technically outside of the Middle East. Um, then we're gonna talk about the Mamluks in Egypt and uh, Napoleon's invasion of Egypt um, and leading to the Albanian uh, Khedivate. Um, then we're gonna talk about Ottoman Syria, the Kurds, Ottoman Iraq, um, Hotakis and Afsharids, uh, which is the next empire in Iran, uh, Qajar Iran, which follows the Afsharids. The 19th century Turkish history, such as Ottomanism uh, and young Turkish revolutions, the Balkan Wars and Albanian independence, the Ottoman collapse and the Armenian genocide, the Turkish War of Independence, the Wars of the Caucasus, which is when we come back to Armenia, of course. Uh, well, the Armenian genocide and the Caucasian Wars, we come back to Armenia, the Turkish Republic, uh, the decline of the Qajars and Reza Shah Pahlavi, um, post-World War I Middle East, um, uh, then the British Imperial Middle East, French Imperial Middle East, Saudi Arabia, um, Arab liberalism, ethnic nationalism, uh, Arab nationalism, all these kinds of political movements, Islamism and jihadism, um, Zionism, World War One, and the Arab Israeli uh, and the Arab Israeli conflict. Um, somebody's asking when the Armenian genocide is. I mean, the date is tentative, 
Uh, it's going to be in March. It's going to be in May sometime. Um, but these things always get pushed back because if the presentation is too long, um, or we get too excited, or whatever, um, or things could happen in, in you know people's schedules, and so the dates might be pushed back. But it's okay, no, that's no problem. What about um, how many how many of the well, let me let me ask you a, a question, but before you answer it, let me uh, elaborate why I'm asking. How many of these do you have the um, exact date and like the description written out? The reason I asked is because what I found out, like for our group, I don't. It may not be universal for all meetups, but for our group, we get the most signups if we post events between like two and four weeks in advance. So if you okay. had the dates um, and the descriptions. I could post these on our meetup group and then they get more people. Cause this one, um, I know I'll, it was kind I'll, of a last I, I, minute I, I deal. Said, I'll, okay, I'll send you the links. I have everything up to um, the uh, the Balkan nationalism, which puts us oh, okay, awesome. March 1st. Um, Cause that last, so the I'll, last I'll send, um, the one and they're all up week. on They're all up on meetup. Um, I'll okay, send awesome. you the links to the individual pages. Okay, no, that's awesome. Okay, terrific. Yeah, I try to, I try to schedule them a month out. Okay, no, that's perfect. Um, as a, yeah, uh, I, told, I told a few people this one, or uh, the, the last week I told a few people this one I told more, and then next time I can tell even more. Uh, yeah, no, um, uh, I'm, I'm so happy that so many people came and, uh, and that, and that people really enjoyed it. Um, you asked when you're, me when you're all done, you'll have, I know they're on YouTube, but when you're all done, you, you'll have to download them and put them on a DVD. <laughs> I, I, I don't think they'll fit, honestly. Right. I mean, like right now I've already it'll, it'll got, be like, it could be like a four DV set like Ken Burns does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but in terms of where I got my interest from, I'm, I'm an Iraqi Jew. This is, this is my, this is my neighborhood. These are, oh, I see. This, this is a world that I understand. And I've, and I feel like I understand in a way that a lot of, uh, Americans around me don't understand it. Um, and they don't, uh, and, and it's sad because they see it sort of as this place where everybody's trying to kill everybody. Um, and there is some truth in that, but you could say the same of Europe 200 years ago. Um, and nobody would, you know, say, you know, why would you study European history from the 1800s? Like, why would you care? And, and, um, I, li I like to enjoy what, these people brought to, to bear and how they thought and what they wanted. And they're just like everybody else. One of my um, teachers at the university of Michigan back a long time ago, Dennis Papazian, um, he was an Armenian and I took one of his classes and he was really interesting. And he, he used to talk about the fact that it's, it's disappointing more Americans don't know about this history um, of, you know, the, the whole entire Eastern Europe people, Americans, they know more about, you know, English history or French history, if they know anything about the history of Europe, but not so much the Eastern European history. So um, he he would be, he's, um, I don't believe he's alive anymore, um, but if he was here, he'd be really uh, flattered and honored that you're um, teaching all these people about this history and sharing all your knowledge uh, with us. So, because he you. was, he was a big proponent of people learning more about the history outside the United States. Yeah, no, and like, look, the American history is a very interesting vehicle, but I think there are a lot of people who are better suited to explaining that than I am, right? Oh, yeah, no, I think I love American history, but that being said, it's we should know what's going on in the rest no, no, of the no, no. world. I'm, I'm, I'm saying like, right, like I, I have a choice about like what I can talk about mm -hmm. and what I can say. And, mm -hmm. and I do know quite a bit about American history, but the thing is, is that since there are so many people who have such a good grasp of American history and can explain it to Americans in a way that other Americans can understand, I don't really see the value add for me, right? Mm -hmm. To talk about those kinds of things. Um, I see the value add here because this is a world that most Americans don't know, don't understand and have no idea about how to find out how to understand. Right. Oh, okay. No, that I think you're doing a great job and appreciate you taking the time. I've really learned a lot um, listening to you these past two weeks. So I really appreciate it. And I know there's a lot of other uh, similar comments from the people that have been doing it yeah, as thank, well. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> so uh, let's see. So if anyone else has any questions for Richard, please let us know before we sign off for the night and let him enjoy the rest of his evening. <laughs>
Yeah, we're doing, um, so uh, Richard's going to be doing a talk about a four-part series on the Crusade that's going to kick off on February 19th. We haven't put it on the calendar just yet. Um, we'll probably do that in the next few days. It was tied up doing some other stuff. But yeah, that'll be on our calendar in the next few days. I'll email that information out to everyone, um, and Richard can teach us all yeah. about the Crusades. That will be another fascinating topic. Yeah, no, um, a lot a lot of the stuff here where we talked about Armeno Crusader relations, you know, we were sort of touching on things that I sort of assumed that people who had been in the series um, for a while would have been familiar with because there were those episodes in the past. But there's a lot of detail that I really didn't discuss here because it's not relevant to the Armenian story. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more relevant to the Crusaders story or to, um, I don't know what you want to say, the Muslims who oppose the Crusaders story. Uh -huh. And the way that I've, I, I scheduled that um, what, with Robert was to make it a 90 minute session. So it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more contained and it's four episodes. I think Robert, I think I sent you the, uh, the, the, the explanation of, of what. Yep. Yeah, you sure did. Yeah. I have that ready to and, go. And um, yeah. I just, I just hadn't posted yet. Cause like I said, for us, the sweet spot's been like two to four weeks. Yeah, but no, that's fine. That now, I, so. I, Get it on the calendar and we're going to start moving forward. Yeah, no, that's the fair. Crusades is such a great idea for a topic because that's something, in my opinion, most Americans have heard of the Crusade. They know maybe like the basic, you know, one or two sentences of what it was all about. But as far as the details, don't really probably know much about it, including myself. So it'd be really fascinating to um, learn about that. So that's really a great topic. Really appreciate you uh, coming up with that idea. No, I like the thing is that the Crusades is about. 200 years worth of wars and states and so there were people who lived were born gave birth to children died and their children lived in crusader states like that like that was their life they they, mm -hmm. they you know it, it's not just like the war in iraq where where we were in for what eight years and then we're out um like th this this was a massive population change a, a huge um a huge personal endeavor and you have really funny stories that happen um like the there are cases where you know a woman a woman on the street would be yelling something uh, she'd be a christian and she'd be yelling something at a muslim and the muslim would just throw up his hands because she was speaking a language from some you know far-flung area of europe and he didn't speak that uh -huh. well, like <laughs> what, what was she trying to tell him and you know there would start to be mobs in the street and and then people would have to be like, just calm down. And like somebody would have to figure out what language she was speaking, what dialect of what thing, because of course languages weren't standardized in Europe either. So what was it French? What kind of French? Was it German? What kind of German? Um, and try and figure out what dispute it was. And it was over, you know, like somebody forgot to pay for an apple or something, right? <laughs> so like it's, but like, it's just a natural part of people's lives that that's, that's how things were. And so people sort of don't see that they they just see sort of the sound bite on the media of like it's another crusade we're invading the middle east and it's like no no it's not it's i'll it's, have to track something. it down it's, oh go ahead sorry no i was gonna say it's something it's something but it's not that i'll have to track it down because it was it was like five years ago but the guy that runs our book discussion group he picked a book one month that was um the Crusades from the Muslim perspective. And uh, it was that we had a really fascinating discussion. Um, and I, but I'll have to go ahead and track down the name yeah. of that book and, send no, it I mean, and see if that's one you're familiar with. Uh, I mean, the thing is that my, per, my, per, uh, my presentations tend to be the Middle Eastern perspective on mm -hmm. X. So to the extent that the Crusades are something that happens in Europe, and, and I do address this, um, I'm not really that interested in what's going on in the Crusades in Europe. I, I, I mention it, I discuss it, but what's really important to me is, okay, now these people have arrived in Jerusalem. These people have arrived in Tyre. These people have arrived in Edessa. These people have arrived in Antioch. What are they doing now? Mm -hmm. Like, how are they organized? Who, who is supporting whom? Um, what, you know, like one of the things I forgot to mention today is that um, in the siege of Antioch, the major break for the crusaders was that there was an Armenian Mamluk, right? A, a forcibly converted Armenian who was Muslim. Um, who was really just pissed at his boss. His boss, Yaxion, um, had refused to pay him his commission and didn't allow him to take the, the, the woman that he wanted. Uh, sorry, uh, Yaxion slept with, slept with his wife. That's what it was. 
Yaxian slept with his wife and he didn't pay him the proper commission. So he turned to, turns around to the crusaders and says, here's a rope, climb, climb the wall. So you <laughs> like, and like, it's just a human, it's a human story, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like there was some epic showdown of philosophical doctrine. No, it's a normal person living a normal life and, you know, they're pissed at their boss. And so they're like, you know what? Screw you. Have they ever made like any, uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm not as familiar with the, I'm, I'm a modern historian, historian kind of guy, but have they made any like Hollywood films about the crusade? You know, like the, the Carlton one, Heston. No, the, the, the one that I like is the one that I like is kingdom of heaven. Now there kingdom are of many. Oh, okay. Yeah. With um, Orlando Bloom. Um, there oh, okay. are many, inaccu- there are many inaccuracies in that film. Um, most, no- um, most notoriously is that, uh, Orlando Bloom's character is sort of like they they have him being born in Europe in order to create that sort of entryway for uh, the viewer to sort of come to Jerusalem with him. Um, but the actual character that he plays, that that historical person was actually born in Jerusalem. Like that, oh, okay. He 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 lived there all his life. And there are some things like Renaud de Chatillon is just like the super villain, even though like he's an he's he's a problem but um in reality but um th- there are there are some there are some skewings but i think if you want to get a sense of what does internal politics look like in the crusader states from a hollywood perspective as opposed to some boring person droning on for a while that would be the movie kingdom of heaven what about um so for someone who's maybe not familiar with the crusades um, would you recommend them watching that film before they tune into your program, or would that be better to watch after they've heard your talks? What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, if they want to watch beforehand, that can definitely clear up some of the misunderstandings. Okay, because um, I could put but, that in the event descriptions to tell people like, hey, it's not really related to our program, but FYI, if you want to watch this movie, yeah, um, and Richard no, that, may no, reference it during his talk. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Um, okay, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I mean the thing. The thing is, just like put an asterisk note that this film has numerous historical inaccuracies, but it does paint a picture of what the conflicts were at the time, who the different parties were involved in this. Oh, okay, okay, no, that's no problem. I'll be happy to set that up. So yeah, okay, all right. Well, that's awesome. What about anybody else have any questions or comments before we sign off? There was a question from Phyllis. If she's still on. I mean, even if she's not still on, I can still answer it. It says, I wonder if there can be a thematic statement for a given period of the Armenian history to tie the events together for those who are completely ignorant of this history. Sure. Um, I, I would say that there are sort of three ages of Armenian history. The first age is... Um, creating an Armenian identity. And that's really the ancient period. We, we saw that with Bianili. We saw that with um, the, the Satrap B period. Then starting with the Orontids in 321 BC until about, let's say 1200 to 1300, yeah, 1300. So from 321 BC until about 1300, you have the Armenian States period, which is where Armenia goes through different periods of di- there are different kingdoms that rise or fall, vassal states, other sorts of regions, but there's always some sort of collective Armenian political entity to a certain degree. Um, and then once you get past the year 1300, then you sort of get in- from 1300 until the end of the Soviet Union, really, um, where Armenians don't have a political voice. Um, and Armenians are sort of... Um, at the whim of whatever conquering power controls historic Armenia and controls Armenian Cilicia. Um, so th- those are really the themes, right? Is that, um, and now of course you have this fourth theme that sort of has developed in the last 30, 40 years of Armenian independence. And what does it mean for Armenians to now go back to having their own country um, where their country is not the most powerful country in the region, which is where it was in the second period, right? Armenia was, with the exception of King Tigranes the Great, Armenia was never the most powerful country in its in its entourage of neighbors. And it always had to play its neighbors across, up uh, against each other. And it always had to use smart diplomacy in order to stay afloat. And that's what Armenia today has to do. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's a very difficult position for Armenia to be in. Okay. 
All right. Awesome. Well, I think that's a wrap for tonight or today, depending on what part of the world people are joining us from. Um, so again, thank you. Anything else from anybody before we wrap up? I have a note that says it's amazing how thoroughly Western Christianity has managed to divorce its history from Eastern Europe and 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 uh, and the Middle East. And I'd say I agree. I, I think mm -hmm. I think. Oh yeah. Um, the once the Catholic Church split from Eastern Orthodoxy, they really, at least in my view, reinvented Christianity as being a Western European, a Western Roman phenomenon. And so we don't see uh, the veneration of people coming out of the East. We don't see a lot of focus. In, in Western European history on some kind of rapprochement between Catholics and uh, and the orthodoxies. We do see a lot about ca rapprochement between Catholics and Protestants because that's mm -hmm. a huge part of Western European history, right? The Protestant revolutions and things like that. But yeah, um, the story, the Catholics managed to sort of write the orthodoxies out of the history books. And it's, mm -hmm. and I think that's just sort of a issue of locality. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, awesome. I have to sign up uh, or I have to sign off. I mean, sorry. Um, I don't know if anybody else is going to stick around. Are you all squared away, Richard? I'm squared away. I'm about to leave. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> we will see you next time. And again, thanks so much for taking the time out to walk us through and educate on this fascinating topic. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming to, oh. to listen. And uh, I really appreciate it. All right. Okay. Awesome. No, the appreciation is all ours, Richard. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care.